Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah My dear sisters and my brothers Wherever you are in the world May the blessings of Allah be upon you And your loved ones Hajj is upon us Few weeks from now Hajj will be the main predominant thing That is happening in the life of Muslims And uh, it is that time of the year Where everything really really stops Because the first 10 days of the Hijjah, Arafah, the slaughtering of an animal as a sacrifice or Qurbani, become, as I said, the far more important event over everything, really. Hajj is scheduled to take place in the few weeks to come, and we are just waiting on the Saudi government to announce when the current month finishes and when the next Hijri month commences so that the first 10 days of Hajj get started. And it is at this time of the year where a few weeks before and then at the time of the 10 days on Hajj that we get bombarded by an incredible amount of Hadith narratives and sayings of the scholars about the virtues and the great rewards a Muslim shall get if they did this and if they did that. You get hadiths that tell you that the Messenger of Allah said that whoever intends to sacrifice an animal should not touch their nail or cut their hair. This is for people who are not in Hajj. Of course, the rewards of these first 10 days and Hajj and the, the fasting of the day, Arafah and all that kind of stuff are extravagant really extravagant and we will see later on inshallah as to how extravagant they are you fast one day of arafah just one day and allah will forgive the next year and the previous year and this is extremely i.e you take from now and you go back one year or you move forward one year and all your sins will be forgiven And that, as I said, as ridiculous as the reward is. But that is what people believe in. And that's what I believed in for years. Forgiveness for an entire two years is a guaranteed. Since, in other words, the message is this. Sin as much as you please. And just one day of Arafah you fast. And you get two years. The past and the next. In other words, the next gets forgiven twice. Because if from now on to the next year is forgiven, next year when you do Arafah, the last year is forgiven. So the next year is guaranteed to be forgiven twice. And as such on Judgment Day, you need and you will be entered in paradise without any accountability. But this is not what the Quran said. Imagine this. One day in Arafah, you get two days forgiveness. And then comes Ashura. You get the forgiveness of the past year. In other words, if you did Hajj, uh, sorry, Arafah and Ashura, the two years of your life that are ahead of you will be forgiven. As I said, if you fast this year in Arafah, the next year, hey, for this year you get the next year. And when you fast next year, you get the past year. So the next year is twice. And when you fast on Ashura, you get the past year's sin forgiven. So it's two years double forgiveness. And uh, this kind of belief that uh, if you fast, you get your rewards forgiven, and things like that, makes the judgment day so much unimportant. Because at the end of the day, you die, you guaranteed paradise. Because every year of your life, you are forgiven two years at the row. Our deeds... Hey, you know, big deal. But then again, the sheikhs later on, when Hajj passes and when all goes away, they will tell you, oh, there is this and there is that, and there is the punishment of the grave and there is the... But you just told me if I fasted, I get my sins forgiven. How come then you are scaring me and on judgment day my book should be given to me? There shouldn't be any bad actions. I've done Arafah and I've done Ashura. You see, my dear sisters and my brothers, in this life, Our deeds are written, and they are written for one purpose. Allah knows. Allah does not forget. But so that on judgment day we are held responsible for our deeds 100%. The angels today are documenting everything we do every second of the day.
because when judgment day that is the grand audit day so to speak all our actions will be laid bare right in front of us and we will read them people who are evil today on judgment day will read in great details the evil that they made on uh, in this life and if you did good you will also read about that good on judgment day it's a double feeling of goodness as opposed to double feeling of badness for the bad things that we did and then on judgment day all the dua we are making today all the dua we making today to forgive us this forgiveness is not written now because on judgment day we still will need to read our actions but the dua the compilation of all the duas we make today will come in effect on judgment day so do as you please today it's documented we just make dua to Allah to forgive us to take good care of us not to expose us all these goodies that we make the dua they shall come to term on judgment day because with this kind of belief Muslims are really like uh, born again Christians you know those Christians that have that not practice and then they go back to the church to a new belief and they are called born again Christian and when they are born again they b- uh, born again sinless but we Muslims you get that every year with the Arafah and Ashwara we do actions and we're not gonna be accounted for on judgment day but that is not true that is not what Allah says yet the sheikhs preach that day in and that day out they tell you forgiveness will be given on judgment day so it's okay just do Arafah and do Ashura and everything is fine my dear sisters and my brothers when Ramadan comes the sheikhs and the propaganda machine and all these people make you feel that Ramadan is the opportunity of a lifetime that's it if you miss Ramadan you're doomed they even tell you that the Ramadan is the month where Allah sets so many humans free of hellfire Wash, uh, the last 10 days of Ramadan coming oh the propaganda machine starts the marketing machine for the last 10 days of Ramadan gets in so much so that you think the last 10 days of Ramadan are the most important days in your life and then they tell you oh in, in those 10 days there is one night the little Qadr so take care of it and again the propaganda machine the marketing machine gets going day in day out until you think and you believe that Laylatul Qadr is the most important night in your life and then comes <laughs> the first 10 days of the Hijjah and they make you believe that the first 10 days of the Hijjah is the opportunity of a lifetime then Ashura comes in is the opportunity of a lifetime then Rajab the middle night of Rajab where Allah forgives everyone on earth of the believers of course and by believers they mean us then that is the up and, and that's it every time something comes in the marketing machine the religious I'm talking about the religious marketing machine the propaganda machine the sheikhs the hadith and this and this and this and at the end of the day how many opportunities we get every year and why is it every time one of these opportunities Ramadan Hajj Arafah Ashura and this and that why is it when they come everything else loses of its importance and value listen to this hadith and this hadith narrative is 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 what you will hear and what the sheikh push and everything it tells us I'm, I'm just going to read the translations to save on time that our mother Aisha reported that the messenger of Allah said there is not a day where Allah sets free more servants i.e., more humans from hellfire than on the day of Arafah i.e. the ninth day of Arafah is the day where Allah sets lots of humans away from hellfire in other terms for example me I'm destined to hellfire it just happens on that day my name gets drawn and that's it I'm not going to go to hellfire but you know and then the hadith carries on saying he draws near i.e. Allah comes near to the humans uh, I'll speak about this in a little bit then boosts to the angels shows off uh, the humans to the angels and says to the angels what do these want and this hadith is in Muslim and other books of hadith and it is authentic the summary of the hadith is simple really when people go to the Mount of Arafah and they stand there for almost uh, uh, the entire day 
Allah comes near to them and sets many of them and many of the believers around the world away from hellfire and then shows off to the angels like look at these people who came here what do they want what kind of a God is this one doesn't Allah know if he knows what these people know why is he asking the angels who do not know what is he trying to prove of course this hadith goes 100% against the Quran because Allah knows Allah knows and he doesn't need to speak to the angels and ask them this question this kind of nonsensical questions Abu Huraira in another hadith reported verily Allah shows off the people of Arafah to the inhabitants of heaven he tells them look at my subservient look at the humans I created that's what he means who have come to me with untidy appearance and dusty again this hadith is reported by Ahmed ibn Hanbal who is the teacher of Bukhari Muslim and few other great scholars of hadith ibn Hibban another hadith collector and al-Hakim also another hadith collector and this hadith is authentic inna allaha yubahi bi ahli arafat ahlu sama fa yaqulu lahum munzuru ila ibadi jauni shu'than qubran Allah shows off the people of Arafah to the inhabitants of heaven i.e. the angels and then Allah addresses these angels look at my people who have come to me with untidy appearance and dusty in another hadith by Jabir and this one is far more disturbing really because it mentions certain things about Allah that are untrue and yet extremely disturbing and yet our sheikhs and everybody out there preaches this hadith uh, uh, unshamedly really this is like nothing Look what it says. Jabir. Jabir is another member of those people who believed in the Messenger. He reports that the Messenger of Allah said, إذا كان يوم عرفة إن الله ينزل إلى سماء الدنيا فيباهي بهم الملائكة. When the day of Arafah comes, Allah, God, descends to the lowest heaven, i.e. the, uh, the, 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 the sky that we look when you raise up your head and look at the sky. Allah is right behind it and what does he do there he praises the people that are in Arafah to the angels and he tells the angels look at my servants and this hadith is also authentically reported by Abdul Razak in his book of Sunnah and few other people these narratives where Allah is boosting to the angels where he comes to the heavenly skies he descends and all these things are blasphemous they take somebody out of Islam yet the Islamic religious church our church our big masjid our big uh, religious machine preaches these things as the absolute truth you hear the Sheikh telling it to you on Jum'a or any talks or uh, sermon here or talk there without any um, there is no problem Allah descends from wherever he is to the lowest part of heaven and then boosts to the angels and says this and says that this is a total bag of blasphemy look at this Allah had stated in the Quran that as far as his essence his being himself his divine majesty he is always at every single second and less than that he is always the highest of all of his creations Allah as is preached uh, in the Salaf in the Sunni and, and the religious world the Islamic religious world Allah is separate he is free from his creation meaning the creation of Allah is there and Allah is somewhere else Allah never ever never ever penetrates what he creates he, he, he doesn't become part of his own creation there is nothing above Allah and there is nothing that is bigger than Allah Allah is the biggest Allah is the highest and he stated this in the Quran many many times but as I said the Islamic religious church preaches this as the absolute truth and I don't know why why we get to this point of uh, they know they know they always tell you oh there is nothing uh, above Allah nothing at the level of Allah and everything else is away from Allah
Yet when he comes to the heavenly skies, as they say, and starts uh, peeping on the ha on the hajjis, on the people that are on Arafah, he starts looking at them as if wh where he is on high above the heavens, he doesn't see clear. He needs to come clear, clear to the humans, and so that he can see them even clearer. Of course, this is lie. And then when he comes to Earth, guess what? The sun, the moon, and all other planets in the entire vast universe that he created becomes above Allah. They will contain Allah. The angels of different heavens, the, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, uh, all these angels, guess what? They will start being higher than Allah and they can look upon Allah because he is down there on the first heaven. As he lingers over uh, earth, admiring humans, what's the problem with this God? Does he have any problem of acceptance? What is he trying to achieve when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows off a human to angels? What did he, if there were six gods and each god has created some people according to his thinking and then our god is the best? Yes, I understand that he shows off to the other gods. A god showing off to a god of what he has done. Yeah, I understand that. But the angels are Allah's creation. I and you and every human out there is Allah's creation. So when Allah shows off the one people over to the others, to someone he created, what is he trying to say? Why is Allah who is the highest? For example, we, let's take the Al-Baqarah, the second surah, the ayah 10255. And they tell you this ayah in the Quran, it is the chief ayah in the Quran. It's the biggest, the most magnificent. They even call it Ayat al-Kursi. Many times when you walk in a store and you find someone has something framed of the Quran, Almost 95% it's this ayah here. The Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyul qayyum la ta'khudhu It's the ayah number 255 from Surah Al-Baqarah. Check it out. Where Allah ends, ends that ayah saying, wa huwa al-aliyyul azim. And he is the most high, the greatest. For anyone who truly believes in Allah, as they should, must believe that at any time during the day or night, every second of any time, every nanosecond of any time, every below that nanosecond at that time, Allah is always, always, always the most high, the greatest. This attribute, this characteristic of Allah doesn't leave him for a split of the smallest part of a second. There is no way that Allah enters this creation. He does not enter earth. He doesn't descend to earth. Not on Hajj day and not on every night. Because according to the Salafis, Allah descends to the lowest heaven of the earth every night. On the last third of the night and forgives people. Which means Allah is never up wherever he should be. Because at every second of the day, somewhere else on earth is the last third of the night. But we are sold these lies. And you will understand in a little bit, inshallah, why the Quran is not the chief uh, driver of Al Islam we have today. And the other thing, as I said, when Allah shows off the angels, what is it? What's in it for him? Like he feels good about himself that, you know what? I created humans, but you know, look at this. They were shipping me. Oh, I love. No, Allah doesn't need fans. A superstar, a rock star, a footballer, a movie uh, star. Yes, they starve and they feed on fans. Allah doesn't. Allah in Allah ghaniyun anil alamin. Allah is, is 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 totally not in need of the entire universe. We all believe in Him, or we all disbelieve in Him. It doesn't do anything to Him. He's completely free of us. But the hadith now, he boosts to the angels and tells them, look at my servants. Allah has stated in the Quran, in the surah number 41, Fussilat, i.e. what he says there is highly detailed, in the ayah 46 exactly. He says, Man amala, man amila salihan fali nafsi. Whoever does good, it is to their own benefit. وَمَنْ أَسَاءَ فَعَلَيْهَا And whoever does evil, it is to their own loss. 
Allah doesn't need to boost because you're a good Muslim. He doesn't. It's for you, for me, for everybody who does good on Judgment Day. See, Allah is clear in whatever He says. But the sheikhs and the Islamic Church are liars. They corrupted Allah's Islam. And on top of it all, they demean the Quran, the dignity, the majesty, and the, the divinity of the Quran has absolutely not a standing with these sheikhs. Allah tells them Allah is the highest, He's the greatest, Allah is free of the humans, Allah is this, and they tell you no. No, 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 Allah comes to earth and goes to the heavenly skies and peeps on the hajjis. Abdullah ibn Abbas is reported to have said, and this hadith also is by Bukhari, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and a huge number of other scholars of hadith, and this hadith is authentic. And in, uh, when Hajj comes by, before the first 10 days of the Hijjah, this is one of the hadith that gets heavily promoted. They say that the Messenger of Allah says, مَا مِنْ أَيَّامِنَ الْعَمَلُ الصَّالِحُ فِيهَا أَحَبُّ إِلَّهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ الْأَيَّامِ يعني أيام العشر. There are no deeds more loved by Allah in any other day except these days and he refers to the first day of the Hijjah. The believers when they heard thus they got surprised and they asked Messenger of Allah not even the jihad for Allah's path i.e. for the sake of Allah i.e. because when you go to war you die and the Messenger is telling you there are if you stay today and you pray two rakat or you, or you give charity or you do an act of goodness that these are the days where no deeds are loved to Allah than in these days meaning it's the ultimate it's the chief and then the messenger gives them the message of their life he says of course not not even al-jihad for the sake of Allah really and then he accepts he goes except a man one man who goes out to battle with his own life and belongings, horse and sword. As I told you before, at the early days of Islam, going to war was a voluntary act. You bring your horse, your sword, your spear, your shield. It's what you bring to the war. And then later on, should you win, you get the equivalent of what you brought in. It was not like today, army paid by the government. But of course he says that this man goes to war with his own life and belongings but does not return with any of them. He dies and loses everything. That is the only exception. But if <laughs> fail that, he will not beat whatever is done in the first 10 days of the Hijjah. In another hadith by a Darimi, again, uh, and by uh, Albani, ruled, uh, and Albani is highly revered and respected and loved Sheikh in the Salafi sphere, uh, sphere and Sunni sphere and all that kind of stuff. So when Al Albani says the hadith is authentic, it's like you tell somebody that is part of the Quran. They will take it and that's that. The, the messenger is reported to have said, there is not a deed that is highly regarded by Allah or more enormously rewarded, like the reward is so immense than a good deed done in the first 10 days of the Hijjah. Uh, that's it. The 10 days of the Hijjah, the reward is the highest. And that's why people tell you, do good, do good in these days. That's it. It was said, somebody asked him, not even jihad for the sake of Allah, going to battle for the sake of Allah. The messenger answers, not even jihad for the sake of Allah, unless a man goes out himself and his belongings and does not come back with anything. And he dies meaning. All what is preached today, as always, any sheikhs that they push on us today uh, is part of Islam, has an agenda behind it. Look at this. If we take the summary of the 10 days of the Hijjah, Allah favors and amplifies the reward of the deeds according to the first 10 days of the Hijjah. Not the intention, not the ability of people. No, He picks up 10 days. In other terms, if you take the Christian calendar, out of the 365 days, you take only 10 days. And if we take the, the Hijri calendar, it's 355, but we take the 10 days, so we are left with 345 days. In other words, the human good deeds 
in 355 days will not equal what you do in 10 days because suddenly 355 days have no value because the 10 days be them no good deed is much higher rewarded except loved admired by Allah than what you do in the 10 days meaning in the 355 days it's far less and this is crazy really crazy they take they say any, any any deed in these 10 days is more important and rewarding than dying for the sake of Allah in 355 days of course dying for the sake of Allah it's, it's not as they present it go invade the country force them for Islam because that's what they call dying for the sake of Allah but this is a topic for another day so what is that what Allah establishes in the Quran is very much demolished with these humanly made up hadith narratives yes they are humans Allah has his and his messenger are innocent from these hadith narratives look at Allah what Allah says about himself about himself and what the hadith make Allah to seem Allah says as I said in Surah Al-Baqarah in the ayah 255 Allah is the most high the greatest and as such the Most High cannot in 10 days or in one day of the day of Arafah leaves his status of being the Most High and gets into the disguise of the earth and leaving six heavens above him and all the angels that are doing the whatever they're doing up there the moon, the stars, the constellations, the universe, the cosmos all these are above Allah doesn't work like that Allah greatest meaning the entire universe as vast and as huge as it is compared to Allah is extremely small so how come somebody who is big that is Allah the greatest well, <laughs> finds himself suddenly trapped in this year of course if you, I, then it happened to me I spoke to Sheikh I said how come that oh they say no 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 salam. how Allah gets to this earth he comes in a manner that befits his majesty and that is how they always win the argument it, he descends every night to earth and you say how does Allah descend when the morning the timings are always night somewhere on earth? they go no that befits his majesty Allah has hands that befit his majesty Allah sits that, uh, that befits his majesty Allah has feet that befits his majesty and of course it is a lie everything that they say is against the Quran for example another ayah Allah says وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ هُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْكَبِيرُ Allah is truly indeed the most high again the greatest and here the greatest is in shape the other one is greatest in shape and value who he is the scary thing is the ayah that I just read that Allah is the high and he is the biggest and things like that is mentioned in Surah Al-Hajj in the surah that talks about Hajj and in that surah Allah has mentioned many times that anyone who disrespects Allah commits an act of shirk and shirk to Allah is as good as making any human being Jesus Christ or anyone else a son of Allah that is associating or giving an attribute that only belongs to Allah to somebody else please pay attention to how Allah lays down some of his attributes and this is not in Surah Al-Hajj somewhere else but look how he speaks about himself and the way he talks about himself has completely been erased by the hadith that we just mentioned that he comes back to the sky and boosts to the angel and is happy like a child dancing yeah 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 they're doing what I told them which is extremely mind-boggling look at what Allah says هُوَ اللَّهُ الَّذِي لَا إِلَهَا إِلَّا هُوَ he certainly is Allah no other deity except Allah of course so that's why we worship Allah and he says who al Malik he is the king um, before I proceed to, to the attributes I want to say something in Arabic the word Allah that's not the name of Allah so many of us believe that uh, Allah is his name it is not his name Allah is the translation that Allah chose for himself to be called with in Arabic because when Allah spoke to Nuh Nuh didn't speak Arabic Nuh spoke his own language 
And when Nuh referred to Allah, he referred to him in the language that Nuh spoke. Every people that came before us that spoke a different language than the Arabic used a different name than to Allah. So they, I don't know how they call him, but for example, today if you, in English we call him God. Everyone understands that we are speaking about what we, the Arab, uh, not we, the Arabs, what the Arabs say is Allah. For example, in the old text of the Hebrew Torah, uh, they call him Yahuwah. Yahuwah in Arabic, Huwa. Is when you say Huwa Allah, Yahuwah, he is. So Huwa is a pronoun in Arabic. In the Torah, in the Hebrew, it's the name of Allah. Uh, you've heard certainly called somebody called Jehovah, the Jehovah Witnesses. So Jehovah is the name of Allah. Elohim. Elohim is the Hebrew name of Allahumma in Arabic. So Elohim, when it got translated to Arabic, become Allahumma. Elohim, Allahumma. And of course we have Allah and so on. So when we speak of Allah, we are referring to the God that everyone else calls differently. On Judgment Day, he might reveal to us his true name. But as of now, Allah is only a reference to the God we worship and in Arabic we refer to him Allah Harab and so on and so forth and the other attributes that he chose for himself. So Allah says he is Allah. There is no other deity that should be worshipped except him. He says then the king, the most holy, the all perfect, the source of serenity, the watcher of all the Almighty, the Supreme in might, the Majestic. And then he ends up this beautiful ayat by saying, Glorified is Allah far above what they associate with Him. So Allah makes it clear that anyone who takes any of His attributes from Him is committing an act of shirk association so when someone tells me allah lives wherever he is and, and he uh, and his size he is the biggest bigger than the entire universe and suddenly allah changes his shape to become small so that he fits in the heavenly skies of the earth and now nowadays we found out that the earth compared to other planets is far smaller so allah becomes smaller than the sun smaller than uranus smaller than this and this and this but this is crazy but the sheikhs, they know this because they, when they talk about the greatness of Allah, they forget the lies they told about him in Hajj. These self-appointed men of religion lie and they are big liars, deliberately or not deliberately, but they are responsible for what they did. And in order for them to pass their lies, they chase the Quran away from Al-Islam. And with that, they corrupted and changed the face of Islam forever. So much so today, I bring a Quran, when in discussion or sometimes we end up talking to people, I bring to them uh, the ayah of Allah in the Quran, which is very clear, as we shall see in a little bit. And they look at me as if I've told them uh, the, the Bible is part of the Quran. It's like some crazy thing. And they can't accept and tell them, and, and the Quran is clear, but they cannot accept it. And they go back to the Hadith. There is no difference between them and between the people who rejected the message of the prophets of Allah. When they are confronted with what Allah says, and it does not agree with the lies they spew, what do they do? They convincingly, they, they willfully lie to your face. And when they do that, and I've seen this many times, they know very well that the Quran disagrees and rejects what they say. Yet, they still insist that you're wrong even if the Quran is with you. And these people are the people that Allah said about وَيَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ الْكَذِبَ وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And they speak and they lie upon Allah all the while being aware of what they are doing. I.e. they are lying. And this is in Surah 2, numbers, uh, sorry, Surah 3, Ali Imran, the Ayah 7, 8. The sheikhs that we have today and we have had all the time, 
are hundred percent aware of what Allah says in the Quran. Heck, they teach the greatness of Allah and His sovereignty every time. Yet when it comes to something that hundred percent contradicts what they believe in, they will in a split of a second reject the Quran and throw it away. Eh, but what can we say? This is the result of the human made up hadith narratives that were gathered, compiled, written down on the third century, almost 250 years after the death of the messenger. And the, the thing is clear. All they have to do is bombard us to distract us. That's all it is. Because despite the clear message of the Quran, we find ourselves today so much bombarded that every Muslim out there would be made to believe that Hajj period is the most important in the entire year in fact, there are some hadiths that say when you go to Hajj and your Hajj is accepted, uh, you do as whatever you f makes you feel that it's correct, you come back home as if you were born the day your mother gave you birth. To me, that is the highest lie a human being can come up with, is to say these kind of things. Because if I take someone, for example, who dealt in drugs, he's part of the drugs cartel, killed people throughout the years, ruined people's lives, stole money, corrupted, you know what these drug people do. And then all it takes for them is to go to Hajj five days, five days, and then comes back home clean as if he was just being born. Uh, it, 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 it aches my mind just a sheikh being able to say this it really aches my mind yet these hajj promoters these first 10 days promoters these arafat days promoters they do the same thing as I said for Ramadan, for Ashura for the middle night of Rajab for Laylatul Qadr, for Eid al-Fitr for this and for that every time some sort of time comes we are told this is the occasion of all occasions. Worship Allah more than ever in these days and you shall get the greatest reward you'll ever get in your entire life. Yet, but in most cases, these people hide what Allah says in the Quran. There is always a side that is hidden and kept away from the eyes of Muslims. And in this small revealer, I would call it, about the Hajj, I will expose certain matters that are kept hidden from you, my brothers and my sisters. They have been kept hidden for thousands, sorry, for hundreds of years, almost a thousand five hundred years. Yet they are mentioned in our books, in our very, very books that we, we almost, <laughs> we abandoned the Quran for these books. When should Hajj be performed? Which time of the year should Hajj be performed? In our days and age, and for the last almost 1,500 years, we are 1,444, but I'm going to just say 1,500 years. It's, it's easy to say 15 centuries. Hajj has always been performed on the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th days of the Hijjah. And those who intend to perform Hajj would go to present-day Saudi Arabia a couple weeks before and would stay a few weeks after. But the five days are the most essential time for their performance of Hajj. These five days, you cannot uh, be absent in any of them. You gotta be there. But the sad truth is, even these five days, each day has a name. And the naming of the day has nothing to do with the Hajj itself, but more with what people do. For example, the eighth day, they call it Yawm Tarwiya, the day of the quenching. And the reason is because back in time, centuries ago, the pilgrims when they go, the pilgrims when they go to Mecca to perform Hajj, they do not have water. 
because when they go to Arafah, they spend the whole day in the mount, on the mount, and there is no water, nothing. So they didn't have water. What did they do? They would spend that day taking as much water as possible and take it with them to the mount of Arafah. And they call that the day of the quenching. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> that is part of Hajj, believe it or that. The ninth day, because they're taking water, they go to the mount of Arafah. And the pilgrimage would wake up early and head to the mountain. The mountain, what they did, they said there is a place where the messenger of Allah stood. Nowadays, people fight to death to be near. You just go on the internet and you find people climbing some place. Some, someone has made an edifice, like, like a small big pole inside it. And th they say, here, he stood up. So people would go there and then it got a little bit more romantic. People signed their names on. Abdul Salam was here and, and they put the date signature. <laughs> It's, it's incredible. But on the ninth day, people go to the Mount of Araf. I, I was in Hajj and I've seen how people are. People today go to the Hajj, to the Mount of Arafah, and because you're gonna spend about seven, eight hours there, there is so much dua you can make. You cannot keep talking for seven, eight hours. People take small booklets from them to read from them. And uh, now the, you can take pictures in them. They have camels. They, now they have tents where they sell food. It's getting a little bit. Water is being sold there. Big, as I said, picture taken. And you spend the entire day in Arafah. They call it the ninth day is the day of Arafah. There are so many hadith narratives that talk about the day of Arafah. But that is where you spend the day. So the eighth day is the day of quenching. The, the, you take as much water and you go to the Mount of Arafah. On the 10th day, that is the day when people slaughter the animal. They cut or shave their hair and throw some pebbles. And the pebbles is, is, is another... It's another sad thing to talk about, but I don't want to go in details about this, but they throw some pebbles. And with these actions... You slaughter the animals, you cut or you shave your hair and you throw the pebbles. Guess what? You can remove your ihram now. Which literally means you can dress, put on your own dress. For men, you stop wearing that white stuff. Women, they don't put on their ihram. And they tell you that's it. But now you just need to go and do small things that are auxiliaries to the hajj. So really, basically, hajj is what? The eighth day you take water, ninth day you go to the mount, ten day you slaughter. That's that. The other days, 11, 12, and 13, are the days when you enjoy the meat and things like that. The, these three days after you have slaughtered the animal, they call them ayyamu tashriq. The days of tashriq. Tashriq is when you cut the meat in small spaces, uh, small portions, and then you put it to the sun so that it dries. Usually the Arabs would put salt on it and they leave the meat to dry. And then once the meat has dried, they put it somewhere and then throughout the year they eat from that meat. So these three days is where the, we slaughter on the 10th day and then we have the three days to enjoy uh, the Eid and everything. So day one, take the water. Day two, stand on the Mount of Arafah. Day three, slaughter, shave, throw racks. Day four, five, six, you also uh, eat your meat and throw some pebbles. And then you, you close your Hajj with going around the Kaaba. And that's that. In brief, this is Hajj. So, one more time. Who decides when Hajj starts? Nowadays, it's the Saudi government. Before, people would walk uh, long distances to go to Mecca. And then when they get there, they start observing. And as soon as they see the new moon, they perform Hajj. Today, we have Saudi Arabia that tells us, oh, this month, the uh, Qaeda has started. The month before Hajj starts on this day. So people start getting there. And usually, when the new moon is announced, you already are in Mecca. So that because when the moon gets started, you start getting ready in the first 10 days. And here is the other angle of this first 10 days is to prepare the Hajj people. So that I know, oh, today is the first day of the 10 days. We all agree on the 8th. There is no disagreement as to when Hajj starts. But what does... The, so now in the hadith, in the sayings of the scholars, Hajj is five days. 
and it has become the norm. 99.99% of Muslims believe and think that Hajj is those uh, five days. But what does Allah say in the Quran? What Allah reveals in the Quran makes what we today believe Hajj is the time or the practice is really a joke. Because the time for Hajj as Allah wanted it was never meant to be the 8th, the 9th, the 10th, 11th and the rest of the days of the Hijjah. In fact, when Allah mentions the time of the Hajj in the Quran, He mentions that Hajj takes place in months. Months, not days. Months, yes. But what does Allah mean by months? For example, if I take the saying of Allah, Al-Hajj Ashhurun Ma'lumat. In the translations to English, it says pilgrimage is made in appointed months with an S at the end. In another translation, pilgrimage is during specific months. Hajj is during 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 well-known months. The Hajj is in the months well known. The Hajj is to be performed in the months that are well known. Then Allah adds, فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجْ So whoever decides to perform the Hajj in them, in these months, then there shall not be any sexuality, no sins or argument in Hajj. Look at it this way. Allah forbade sexual acts, sins or dispute and argument between people when they are performing Hajj, when they are in Hajj, there to perform it. If someone is gone just for five days, Hey, sexual, uh, not having sex is no big deal. Five days, who's going to die because they haven't had sex for five days? And the same thing, uh, committing sins. Five days, you can easily withhold yourself and you don't argue with people in five days. Yet, our sheikhs and our scholars, uh, scholars have disputed this issue back in time. When on the third century, when Al-Islam that people know today has been decided and written and put on books and everything, when these sheikhs have decided what goes and what doesn't in Islam, they came with a problem. The sheikhs were always, always approved by the government. Any school of thoughts, any sheikh deduction, any anything, even the hadiths that are written today in Bukhari, Muslim Abu Dawood, all these are heavily influenced by government approval or disapproval. If the government approves a sheikh, he'll be put forth to the front, like Al Bukhari. He was pro the government and some other issues, political issues. He's made a huge. Other scholars of hadith far more intelligent than al-Bukhari were rejected. Why? Because they didn't agree with the government. So what the, the <laughs> in the third century, everything that Muslims know today, apart from the Quran, is heavily influenced by what the government say. But anyhow, let's go back to this. Uh, the scholars, when Allah mentioned that the Hajj takes place in months, the scholars were faced with a huge problem. They just didn't know what the months of Al-Hajj were. And this is a problem. They had absolutely and still up to today have no clue as to what the months of Hajj are. And because of this problem, they always stick to one opinion. If it is, if it is or was left to the different school of thoughts, guess what? We will have different Hajjs through the year. And the dispute between scholars got settled, sadly, because the Saudi government is now uh, deciding when Hajj was. Before, it was whoever was in power. When the Ottoman Empire was ruling the world, uh, the Islamic world, it was the king who decided when Hajj was. Before that, the Abbasian, before that, the Umawi, each dynasty who came to control the world decided when Hajj was. And out, as I said, of the five days, you've got two days that represent Hajj. And on the third day, you, you finish halfway and that's it. The rest is auxiliary. So now, let me, and I call this the moments of the hidden truth. Ibn Kathir, 
This Ibn Kathir is a direct student of Ibn Taymiyyah. He is a scholar from the 8th Hijri century and he lived somewhere in uh, somewhere 1300 years as opposed to 2023 he was 1300 uh, Christian era. Uh, Ibn Kathir is a very well and known the Salafis love him to death and his views are highly respected and he is also a Sunni scholar every cult out there loves Ibn Kathir just like they love Ibn Taymiyyah they disagree about Ibn Taymiyyah they disagree about this but Ibn Kathir is highly respected and, 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 and loved so much so that the Saudi government printed thousands of his book of tafsir and gave it free to the people around the world this man Ibn Kathir was a historian he wrote history he was a scholar of hadith he wrote books about the hadith he was a faqih and meaning the jurisprudence he was like a jurist when you for the halal and the haram and he made the tafsir of the Quran and explained its meanings yet this scholar found himself just like any other in the middle of a huge dispute which months are these months of Hajj? He tried to explain this in his books of the Tafsir. And you can read about it if you just open this and you will find it. It's there. The sheikhs have seen it, but they don't speak about it. What does or what did or what does Ibn Kathir along? Because when Ibn Kathir speaks, he's just representing other arguments as well. When he spoke about the Hajj, when is Hajj to be performed? He says, and I'm going to just read with uh, what he wrote in English. He goes, the opinion to enter in Al-Ihram state, i.e. the beginning of Hajj, in all the year is a valid and is the view opinion of. What he means? i.e. the beginning of Hajj when can you perform Hajj can be done throughout the entire year not the Hajjah alone no 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 it's the entire year this view is not only his for uh, you know what he's just one say no, no 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 he says this view is also the view of and then he mentions a huge number of scholars that are highly respected and followed loved by the Salafis by the Sunnis by everybody out there and I will start by saying by Malik Imam Malik he, well, he died in 180 or 79 80 yeah Hijri meaning he died on the in the second uh, century and he is the founding of uh, the founder of the Maliki school of thought today followed around the world specifically in Morocco Algeria Tunisia and some part of Libya some part of Egypt and uh, so the Maliki school of thought in their books they believe Hajj can be performed any time in the entire year you heard it right not in the Hijjah not in the 10 days of the Hijjah in the entire year is this just Malik? No, no, no. Abu Hanifa. Today is mentioned hugely in the in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, these sub-Asian countries or the Asian countries, and also uh, in uh, Turkey and few parts of the world in Egypt and things like that. Abu Hanifa died in the year 150, again in the second Hijri century, and is the founding person of the Hanafi school of thought the Hanafi school of thought believe that Hajj can be performed any time during the year is this just two people no Ahmed ibn Hanbal this man died in 241 Hijri i.e. in the third century he is the teacher of Bukhari Muslim Abu Dawood Tirmidhi he's, he's well and he is the founding man of the Hanbali school of thought the Hanbali school of thought throughout history is what we know as the Salafi the Salafis are the Hanbali school of thought in disguise he believed that Hajj can be performed throughout the year the sad news is and the shocking thing is Saudi Arabia is a hardcore follower of Ahmed ibn Hanbal school of thought 
And yet, they deliberately disregard his statement that Hajj can be performed in any time throughout the year to the five days in the Hajjah. Ibn Kathir then goes on and mentions another fourth scholar, Ishaq ibn Rahawi, and this man died in 238 Hijri, in the middle of the 3rd century. And what they say about this Sheikh is the following. They say Ishaq ibn Rahawi, he is a great Imam, i.e. leader, religious leader. He is the Sheikh of the East, the master of memorization. He memorized the Quran in all different versions. And they also say he is the great Imam of the Muslims and the chief scholar of religion in his time. He is also a hadith, jurisprudence, i.e. fiqh for the halal and haram, recitation of the Quran, and was known for his truthfulness, piety, and self-discipline. And he had a great self-discipline against the worldly temptations and desires. He is the founder of an unsuccessful school of thought. Just his school of thought didn't carry on. Ishaq ibn Rahawi says Hajj can be performed throughout the year, not only the five days of the Hijjah. Sufyan Athawri, a man who died in 161 Hijri, the second century. And in his biography today, they say about him, he is the scholar of scholars. He is the scholar of scholars of the Hadith. He lived among the generations which came after the companions and as such is referred to as one of the followers of the followers. Of course, which places him in the three favorite generations as per another hadith. He was the chief scholar of the people of Iraq. He had a school of thoughts which stopped existing on the 8th century, uh, the Hijri century, which means his school of thought carried on for eight centuries and then stopped existing. Sufyan Thawri says that Hajj can be performed in the entire year. Another man called Al-Layth ibn Sa'd, this man died in the year 17575 Hijri, the second century. Also when they speak about him, they say he is the Sheikh of Islam, the ultimate authority in Islam, the chief scholar, the chief Imam in the science of Hadith. This is a man who memorized over a hundred thousand hadith narratives with the chain of narrators and the content of the hadith itself. In his biography, one more time, he says that he is the chief faqih, jurist for the halal and the haram, a chief hadith scholar, a chief scholar. The titles are endless. And al ibn Sa'd, just like the other people, believes that Hajj is to be performed in every single month of the year. So now the problem is this. If these great scholars, all of them, and also a Shafi, a Shafi said the same thing, it's throughout the year. So if these scholars say that Hajj can be performed in the entire year, when does it start and when does it finish? Well, Allah has explained in the Quran when Hajj begins and when Hajj finishes. And I'll, I'll do this in, the, in, in part two of this talk. Uh, I'll end here, inshallah, and carry on in the next one. Salam.